others will be forced to operate development academies that run over the winter. The fucking winter, in a summer sport, all this will achieve is more players at the top clubs that never get near the first team, while other players will be lost from the game altogether. Cass have over 90 players at various stages in their setup. What happens to them? The reasons given for the denials are laughable or non-existent. I also note that both Wakey and Hull FC, two teams in the so-called shootouts, have employees in their setup that also work for the RFL. All this does is reinforce the belief that the RFL are not fit for purpose. The silence from the successful clubs is also disappointing. They must be able to see this is not good for the sport. Hashtag fuck off Ralph. And Lee Whitnell said, surely a more sensible mandate from the RFL will be to insist that all Super League clubs must have an elite level academy, with strong links to the community game and schools nearby, as a condition of entry. To prevent clubs from developing their own players is counterintuitive to everything the game should be trying to achieve. So fan reviews all um, sort of on the negative slash confused um, scale. Uh, where where do you sit with things, Sarah, around this? Um, given that you know your club have been granted an elite academy. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's great for us that we've got it. Um, I'm pleased that we've got it. However, that you know, what does that do for? 50% of the youth in the city that are already on these, you know, in these academies. Um, I think it, I just, I totally agree with, with Lee that all Super League clubs should have them. Like, why not? Why, why do we have to have a set number? Why can't we say it's a, a prerequisite to being a Super League club? Yeah, well, the um, this process isn't, and this decision that there was going to be twelve clubs, I assume, was made some time ago. I can't remember exactly when it was um, when it was announced, but I know we've talked about this before the panel convened and all this sort of stuff because it, it it was announced that this was going to be happening two years ago, weren't it? When we were told that we were going to be moving to under eighteens and reserves rather than um, under nineteens, um, so. I, I think maybe everyone kind of expected that all the Super League clubs that had a license already would retain them um, and that would leave Salford on the outer still because they didn't have one and whoever else would might be in Super League if it wasn't going to be London who um, who already have one. So, um, so I think it's a bit surprising that then only 10 were handed out and I understand the money was there to give it to 12 um so it's not about the money not being there to have the 12 ma- that that were the maximum so I'd, i do find that part a bit confusing and, and until we have a better understanding of the scorecard used to make the decision i suppose um which we have seen in the past haven't we when academy clubs were audited and reviewed and graded we'd get to see the gradings that they were given um which we haven't seen this time around so maybe the process isn't as as um, transparent and the communication not as open as as i would like as a, as a fan trying to understand all of this i think yeah i mean you look at the reasons um and obviously the only you know i i can only really talk about this city and as much as i hate rovers you know the i have you know being objective so you know ensure that academies are operated sensitively and proportionately to the com- the continuing good health of the community game, I've seen no evidence that they're not. Well, Hull's an or interesting one, though, isn't it? Because of... Rovers and FC voluntarily decided to run a joint academy for a period of time that yeah. they then disbanded. Basically, they disbanded on the announcement of this, didn't they? Which was... Yeah. The timing of it was around the same time, back in 2019. But so it's almost like Rovers were happy to kind of lump into Hull just having one academy. Yeah. But then it seems like the sensible decision would have been to have retained a joint academy then, because they would have both been able to take players directly from that pl- that that pool, rather was... than Rovers having to find a backdoor to get that talent now. Yeah, but I think it was felt that actually by having a joint academy, it was stifling the development of players. 
because you were only allowing half as many players, I guess in the same way as you are now, you know, instead of being able to develop, say, two fullbacks, you're back to only one fullback. Yeah, I, I am, I, I totally get the view that, you know, you've expressed that kind of David's question Lee's mentioned about why shouldn't they all have, have one. I, I kind of think they probably should all have one or they should all have something that's well organised and brings through players. It, ultimately, some clubs weren't bringing through players and that's been a factor in the decision making. Now, whether it's right that that then puts the players that are currently in their programs into some sort of limbo, that's a whole other problem that needs to be addressed. I do think that some of the prob, some of the cons- issues that this creates, like the one Rob brings up about the kids within the system at Castleford, yeah. the ones at Hull, Hull KR, the ones at Bradford, even, um, what happens with them now? Uh, that's a totally legitimate, you know, thing to ask about and what i would say is that's the areas where the rfl should be showing showing some sort of support and leadership through this also getting those clubs that now have to run development academies um up to speed in how they operate in that different way needs to be something that the rfl should be supporting because the rf well not the rfl the independent board have made a decision to enforce a criteria that were agreed between the rfl and sport england so that's where we're at now with that and i think putting personal views aside on the judgments that were made especially because we can't see all the reasoning behind it and certainly let's drop the conspiracy theories if there's people at wakefield and hull fc that work for the rfl in de- in p- player development it's because they're good you know it's not because of you know it's people work in various roles because they're capable and in demand and that sort of stuff so let's put the conspiracy theories behind it because ultimately you know everyone fed into this decision but rfl and sport england have come to the conclusion that this is how it needs to be they've put together a board to make the decision they just they have to help the clubs that this decision affects yeah you know i think that's fundamentally a problem here the fact that participation is down is a factor in why we feel as a sport the you don't need to, you shouldn't have as many academies great fine but let's also be working on increasing participation so yeah. you know alongside this what we're doing with academies the sport needs to also bring in a what we're doing to increase participation um plan from the yeah. rfl from sport england the two bodies that are the two important parts of participation um, and in fact, the RFL's plan around and support Sport England, it seems, plan around participation is making people pay to participate, which actually might, even though it happens in all other sports, um, it, that should we'd expect harm participation, not develop participation. A lot of people might play rugby league because it's cheaper to play than other sports because they come in, they're, they're in deprived areas that have been forgotten about by, you know. Um, governments so it's it's hard to balance it all out and that's where i see the problems not in that castleford and hull care haven't got academy licenses necessarily but in that where's the whole thing it looks to me sarah like the rfl have actually come up with a strategy here around academies which is fair enough i think extending the term out great um making sure like reserves are coming back that's part of this great there's a there's an element of strategy there but then there's a part of the strategy that's missing and there's certainly a start of the a part of the planning and preparation that's missing i think as well something that you touched on is like the these kids have signed up for however long two years three years and now you're just saying okay you lost last year because of covid and that's it bye you're gone and like what is what well, I, I see this is where I suppose we need to understand where each other, we, each of the clubs are at with their system. So it's not that these clubs can't run some sort of academy. And it's also not that these clubs can't have these players on their books. There's reserves next year. However many games that'll involve, that'll involve the top end players of the under 19s at both of those two Super League clubs, as it will anything Salford were planning on having as an under-19s, anything Lee were planning, you know, or whoever it might be. So 
so I suppose you won't lose as many as people fear you'll lose, but there's going to be a gap, isn't there? And, well, and what also, happens with those with, players? Do they... And and with the, you know, and I think that's the, a lot of the clubs don't know, you know, and if they don't have the elite academy licence, then can they afford to keep on their staff in the same way? Well, I think the... <sighs> Yeah, well, the money isn't a huge amount of money, so you'd hope clubs, you'd, you'd hope clubs can afford something to do something. And you, but this is a big problem with it as well. I think there should be funding still to these other clubs. How can you produce a development academy in a new? So you're going into a new player pathway, which I think is a really, you know, it's an opportunity there. There is an opportunity to drive participation, bring different people into the sport that might not have been in the sport, and they might you might not get as many top level players in your own academy it doesn't mean you can't buy them when they drop out of other academies but again something needs to have a solution there but you know it's it should be seen as an opportunity because you'll be going and looking for players where the other clubs aren't looking for players already so so there's still opportunities there and you can get some of your players into these colleges so that they can be in those systems still so so there's still something that can be done there so there's still things here that can be seen as an opportunity in a, in a different way and Castleford can continue their reaching outside of their own geographical area because they can set up partnerships with colleges in Cumbria in Wales in the Midlands what have you so there's still things that can can be done to give those guys opportunities and that sort of thing and the hope is that a lot of these players will return to the community game and maybe find a different way into the professional or semi-professional game than they otherwise would have done. Um, clearly, that's within the rationale that they want some of that to happen. And I guess the expectation as well is some of the top players will end up in other academies. Um, academies that might have a more proven track record of producing Super League and international players than the ones that haven't got the licenses now. So in those aspects, there's rationale, there's a strategy to kind of support getting the best young talent playing against the best young talent but still have other ways of finding new people to bring through different pathways into the sport i think all of that can be seen as opportunity sensibles planning that sort of stuff if you take away the emotion of which clubs it is that have got them from it but but something has to be done to deal with those people that might feel disenfranchised and like you're saying like are anyone actually thinking about these people and how how to support them to go a different way yeah i just i think it's another one of these right we've made a decision there we go with and it feels like with a lack of forethought as to um yeah support for those people that have lost a lot and um yeah, just sort of what the plan is going forward and any justification as to why this decision has been made in the way it has been made. Yeah, there's there's bits missing from the communication there. And I think we now live in a world where people don't sort of openly talk about the decisions in the same way because they're going to get criticised every which way. But that's not a way to operate, I don't think, as a... You know, our government certainly shouldn't operate the way they operate and not talk truthfully to its people. And neither should, you know, neither should governing bodies of sport and neither should people who run big companies, big corporations, all of that. You know, it, it, it might be a time for the world to start being a bit more fucking grown up and have actual conversations and explain decisions. And, and people then can have grown up conversations about them as well, you would hope. Um, so you're right, Sarah, that, that, that part's sorely lacking here. Um, and therefore... I think, you know, then the outcome is that everyone gets pissed off and says yeah. well. Whereas actually, if you know why or, you know, and what's l l the likely outcome or whatever else, especially those people who maybe aren't directly affected could at least initially have a more rational opinion on it. Yeah, one of and the things um, other oh, people, you know, fans of those clubs as well. Yeah, one of the other things I, whilst overall, you know, I'm, I, I want to be positive about these sorts of things where where we can be. One of the things I do have a real problem with as well in this is that the other that the clubs are going to get details of what they can do better or what they can do more or what they can do differently. How how have you? But they have to wait until 2024 
So, yeah. but there's two spare lights.